Welcome back to this great academy in biology where we're now covering food. And when you look at food, you actually have to go right back down to the very smallest part, which are the elements of food. That's the things that are involved in life forms and the things that keep us going. So we first of all start off with carbon and hydrogen. They're two atoms, two different kinds of atoms that combine to make all the fuels that we know. If you happen to be doing chemistry, that's a massive one and you would have learned it from junior science. But just add one more kind of atom, oxygen, and suddenly you have all the ingredients you need for making carbohydrates and lipids. Add another element, nitrogen, N, and you've made a significant amount of amino acids which will build up to proteins. Add a little extra sulfur and you make other varieties of proteins. And then one more element, which we know as phosphorus, that immediately makes um, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA. These are both nucleic acids. These are the blueprints of life and that you've heard of before many times. So when you look at those, there aren't that many. And then add a few other things. Uh, trace elements like V, Phi, Fo, Fum, as hard as nails, as tough as they come, iron, copper, magnesium, and some other elements like calcium. Then you actually have the ingredients for life. And how do you get that into you? In the form of food. So we are supposed to know that these things are called, combined together, when all of those atoms are varieties of those atoms and combinations, you make a thing called biomolecules. Now, as the name suggests, they are molecules made bio within a living cell. They're made within a living cell. And on our course, we're supposed to know in detail three three varieties, the carbohydrates, the fats, or the proper name for them, is, which is lipids, and proteins. So we're going to look at the carbohydrates first. Okay, so first of all, we have to know carbohydrate. They're made up of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We said that already. Now, hydrate, when you think of the word hydrate, you think of water, and that's exactly what you should be thinking of. Now, if you are not a chemist, it doesn't really matter. You should be able to say that there's C, capital C, capital H, is represent hydrogen, and capital O stand for uh, oxygen. And the formula for water is H2O. And when you put H2O in a bracket after the carbons, you have an X. It's called a fixed ratio. And whatever X is, Y must also be. So carbohydrate, carbon hydrate is water. And you can see that you have an X and a Y. The X and the Y have to be the same. So if this is six, this will be six as well, which will mean that there'll be six carbons, 12 hydrogens and six oxygens. That bracket on the outside represents it in two ways. And there you go. X and Y are the same value. Carbohydrate. Okay. Now the carbohydrates sound really complicated, but when we break them down, they're really very much a very simple situation. When you go from the bottom to the top, you start off with monosaccharides. Monosaccharides mean one unit. And you can see I've made a little hexagon with a glucose, a G inside. Now, when you stick two glucoses together, you make disaccharide, mono being one, di being two, like a pair of glasses held together by a bond. And then when you put them all together, and there are lots of ways in which they are combined, you make polysaccharides. So carbohydrates are subdivided into monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Now let's take a little closer. Okay, the monosaccharides, the very basic ones, there are two on your course. They are called glucose and fructose. Now, what are they for? They provide instant energy for respiration, which is what your cells are doing all the time. If they weren't, you'd be dead. They'd be cell death. They are described as reducing sugars. And the examples that you have to know are glucose and fructose. Now, again, you do not have to know this picture. All I wanted you to see was you can only see O's, C's and H's. The same here. Glucose and fructose are actually identical, except they're just arranged differently. You still have C6H12O6 for fructose. So what I just drew them was made them shape differently. That's all. Now, there is one 
practical in this section here for the monosaccharide and it is called the test for reducing sugars. And what you use is either Benedict solution or failing solution one and two. Either way, they are both royal blue and you need to heat, not boil. I may have to get out of the way for this one. Yes. OK, so the picture here shows you a Bunsen burner. It's never a good idea to use a Bunsen burner in this case because an awful lot of people think you have to then boil it. And of course, uh, the department know that people misinterpret this picture, even though there's a picture from the Department of Education guidelines for teachers. This picture should maybe just have a water bath. You heat the water and this royal blue solution that you've added to two test tubes. This one has a glucose solution. This test tube has only water. It's your control. And what happens is you add the blue gluco uh, Benedict solution or the failing solution to both of these and they are initially blue, but the one that has a reducing sugar, either glucose or fructose, that will turn a brick red or orange colour. And the next slide is going to show you one from my lab. The only difference is this is a water bath. And as you can see, they were testing 7-Up. It didn't have any glucose in it. Honey certainly did. And this is a glucose solution. But this one was just pure water. And I hope you can see that that's just staying blue. It's control. OK, now the disaccharides. So that's monosaccharides done. The disaccharides, look at the, don't look at the picture too much. Look at the carbons and hydrogens. Don't worry about that so much. You have maltose, which are two glucoses bonded together, and sucrose, which is a glucose and a fructose. So they're two monosaccharides bonded together. And when it's glucose and glucose, you call it maltose. When it's sucrose and fructose, glucose and fructose, it's called sucrose. That's what you sprinkle on your cornflakes. That's your icing sugar, castor sugar and granulated sugar. This is the sweetness you find in the inner, inside of a Maltesers, not the outside chocolate part, which is great. But the Malteser, the maltose is the sugar. So it's two glucoses. There is no practical in this section. But now we go to the next one, which is the polysaccharides. Out of the way, Stephanie. OK, now, so the polysaccharides, there's a whole variety and you have to know a few. The first one I'm going to mention is called cellulose. If you've ever crunched into an apple and mm, chewed into it, the crunchy bit of the cell walls, the cell walls like this uh, onion or orange uh, container, this cell wall, OK, this is like what it is. And this is made exclusively of a whole load of glucoses in a kind of a web structure, which is fine. Hopefully you can see what I'm talking about. So that's a structural. It's got a job as being a structure. So this is cellulose and it's made. I hope you can see nothing but glucoses made into big webs. Now, when you have glycogen, which is what you would find in yours or my liver or my muscles, this is a storage of energy that we have. And glycogen is actually like a stack of coins stacked up together, loads of little glucose molecules stacked up. That's different, but they're both made of glucose. It's how they're held together is what makes the difference. Now, the next one you don't have to know, so I didn't put a picture in, but I do need to name them. Chitin. You find this, it's structural, you find this in the little exoskeletons of insects and in fungal cell walls and lignin, which you find in the water conducting cells called xylem in plants. It's the wood. And then you also have starch. Well, here's a picture you do need to know and it makes sense. All I've done is I've uh, drawn a whole load of glucoses all in a row like a string of pearls. So just look at the three pictures. I have G in every one of them. Glucose is stacked, is called glycogen. You find that in animals, humans, animals, all other animals. This you don't find in animals except in our digestive tract because we've been eating apples and fibre of any description. This is cellulose, all glucoses. Now the size is just simply so that you can get an idea of it. And then the, in a long string, and curled round and round and round each other. That is starch. Now, there is a test for starch and it is iodine. 
And when you add it to a test tube, which has starch in it, it will go a blue black color. It'll go from a yellowy orange color to blue black. And I'm going to get out of the way again. This time you don't need heat. You just see the two test tubes in a rack, one with water, which is your um, control, and the other has some starch in it. And this picture here on the right hand side says water only. You can see the color of the iodine in that one. But this said starch only and it went blue black. And this one is flour because, of course, flour has lots of starch. Now, the carbohydrates are now monosaccharides, disaccharides and polysaccharides. Now we need to know where the sources are. Well, you can see sucrose, which is a disaccharide in your table sugar. You can see starch inside the potatoes. You would see cellulose in plants of any description. I could have shown you a picture of celery or lettuce. The cell walls are what uh, they're in. But this one is a microscope, an electron micrograph actually from, and the glycogen is a molecule inside living cells, which is why it's difficult for you to see. Now, they have roles, uses. Now, we're not talking about a breakfast role. We're talking about the jobs that they do. And so some of them are involved in living things for making structure and the other are metabolic. In other words, being used within the activities of the cell itself, like growing hair and things like that. So let's talk about the structural. I've already mentioned it. You can see some wood up there behind me. So cellulose and lignin are plant structural carbohydrates. In other words, they're belonging to the plants. The plants make them and they use them for making wood. If you also look at chitin, you find that in animal and fungal structural carbohydrates. So animals are uh, the animal would be the little ladybird here. That exoskeleton, that structure there, that's made of chitin, which is a structural carbohydrate. And the fungal cells of mushrooms and things like that, that's also chitin. Now they're structural. Now, metabolic carbohydrates. This one you've got to think about. If you were fairly low and you took something that had a lot of high sugar, low glu you know, lots of glucose in it, like a leucosate or something like that, that gives you instant energy for respiration. You want sometimes complex carbohydrates. So sucrose, maltose and starch, you know, potatoes and things like that, breads, they are plant energy storage. Now, the fact that we use them for ourselves, they, they take a while before they're in our systems, but they come in as glucose when we've finally broken them down. And then as animals, we would actually have glycogen. Glycogen is our animal energy storage. Okay, now we're into the second of the biomolecules. We only have three and the second one are called fats. You'll notice, oh, she hasn't changed the C, H and O. That's because the difference is still C, H and O, but how they're arranged. And I usually go, there is no particular ratio and the O count is low. That's a bit weird, I know. So what exactly are fats? Well, fats and lipids are the same thing. And lipids is the technical name for them. They are made of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And here is one thing that people really make a big mistake about. A lipid at that is a liquid at room temperature is called an oil. A lipid that is a solid at room temperature is called a fat. OK, so get those two correct. Now, I just drew this picture. You know, this is like a signpost and three signs going all the same direction. These are fatty acids and glycerol. Now, the black circles represent carbon. The white ones represent hydrogen and the red ones represent oxygen. Just notice there aren't that many red ones. The O is low. The oxygen is low. Now, um, artists that are working on textbooks usually use a picture. They don't put in the details on this. But the truth is that uh, a triglyceride is the name of a unit. And remember, all you see are C's, H's and O's. This is more like what it looks like. Here is like a head with three legs. It's like an octopus with just three legs. And you can see all the carbons. I've marked them in and all the hydrogens. And there the O's are. Now, that is what a lipid or a fat looks like. And what makes the difference? Well, how long those legs are, 
and whether there is any spaces between here and here. That would mean that there's a double bond. You don't have to know that, but that's called unsaturated. So this one is unsaturated. That one's a very saturated fat. So this leg, but the three legs, the fatty acids, three fatty acids and a glycerol make what is called a triglyceride. And the triglyceride, you have to know, it's the unit of a lipid. Okay, so we have to test for fats. Well, first of all, that's a very easy thing. You take a piece of brown envelope and put on it a stain of water, which of course it'll stain and then it'll dry out. But um, that's the control. And then put a little stain of oil, cooking oil or something like that. And when you hold them up to the light, they will make a translucent stain. Light can pass through, but you can't see through. That would be transparent. Translucent will be what you've got. Down here, my favorite picture, the sources of lipids. Where would you get them from? Mm, chocolate sweets. Oh, I know all about that. Okay. Now, what are their roles? Remember, we've talked about it before. They are, in living things, the source of energy. You store your food. Oh, I know all about that. And they also protect um, your vital organs are often surrounded with a layer of uh, fat to keep you warm. Your kidneys particularly have a, a complete little casing around them. Uh, subcutaneous fat, you have a little bit of blubber and you actually do need it. I love this little picture of this guy. And that's the secondary function or the secondary role of uh, fats is for insulation. Like quails and dolphins, their body temperature has to stay at 37 degrees because they're, they're mammals like you and I. So how do they do that in freezing cold water? They have blubber and they keep nice and warm. So it is another role. But the main role is energy storage. Okay, so now we get to the third one. The third one is proteins. Uh, what have I added? N. And sometimes... Yes. Okay, so proteins are built up like the carbohydrates and the simplest ones are called amino acids. Then they build up to peptides and then polypeptides. Now, again, I'm being the chemist. I want you to see the C's, the H's and O's. Do not try to remember to draw this at all. You notice that there's a nitrogen. This nitrogen is going to make the amino, amino part, and this is the acid bit. Now, look at this picture, and all I'm doing is I'm going to change, nothing there, nothing there, I'm just going to change here, a replaceable sidearm. Now, it could be between here and here, it could stretch that way, but that doesn't matter. All you have to know is that it's going to change. So what's the difference between that and that? Oh, I added a CH2. Okay, I'm going to click again. And then I'm going to, oh, another little stretch, another little stretch, another little stretch. Now, they're all different. They all have the same common thing here and here. That did not change, neither did that. This part changed, and this is what makes the different amino acids. Now, we have 20 common amino acids you'll get from your food, and then another six rare ones, and you need them. All living organisms need them. Now, think about that. 26 is like the 26 letters of the alphabet. Okay. Now, in order to represent all these amino acids in a simple way, we make a little oval around this one. We might make a rectangle around that shaped one. And what they do is amino acids, one will join to the other. It's like stringing beads one to the next. You know, like imagine you had a needle and thread and you were putting a bead down through them. You stretch them along and you bond them with called peptide bonds. So the amino acids, when you have more than two, you make a peptide. Now you can see these are a whole load of different amino acids and more than 20 strung along in a peptide chain is called a polypeptide. Poly meaning many. Now, sometimes they get well over 200. And so you have to sort of bend them over. They're really long and you have to bend them round and then you're going to make the protein. Now, let me move myself out of the way. The type of protein formed is determined by the sequence. So that could be for making your hair. Another combination would be for a teardrop the protein in a teardrop. So they can, they have to be folded then. They have to be folded in a certain way. So I have this balloon that uh, Mary Trace was using a little while ago. So this balloon folded over in that way might make the ingredient of a particular type of protein. Okay, so of course they are either structural or metabolic. Okay, so what about your sources? Well, you can see them all there. You can see me as well. 
uh, all the fish, pulses, meats and eggs and even things like tofu and beans. So they're sources. OK, what about their roles? We have to know what they do. OK, they have amino acids, built proteins in two possible roles, structural and metabolic. OK. These are structural roles. Now, this type is the building blocks and these two little organisms know them very well. These structural proteins, you could have keratin for your hair, keratin for your fingernails, collagen for your skin, glycoproteins, which is a protein, which is collagen and um, glucose, a protein and a carbohydrate for your muscles. The eye cornea, the transparent part of your eye, that's uh, glycoproteins. And then the, um, sorry, the eye cornea is collagen and keratin and ligaments, collagen and glycoproteins. So the variety is there. What would I like you to remember? The word collagen and the word keratin. Collagen, because you'll come across it in the next section when we de deal with blood. So they're the structural parts. What about the metabolic, the things that make uh, us alive? Well, of course, all these proteins that you see in blood, like your red blood cells, the red blood corpuscles, the white blood cells, that's a picture of your, uh, the hemoglobin, that's a protein. And your white blood cells that are fighting you, fighting all the infections that you have, especially virus ones, they're all made of protein as well. And then you have the enzymes and they're also protein in nature as well. So the, the proteins are absolutely essential. Now, there's a test for protein. And again, you don't need a water bath. The only one you needed a water bath one was for the simple carbohydrate, the reducing sugar one. Well, in this case, what you have is two test tubes. You could have water in one and you're going to have a source of protein. Generally, we take the white of an egg or the transparent part of an egg um, and, and whip it up with some water. Or you could just take milk. So this is what I have here. That's milk and that's egg white and that's water only. And you add the biuret reagent and the biuret reagent is not not burette. Uh, biuret reagent, which is sodium hydroxide and copper sulfate. Sometimes the teacher will tell you that or they will say biuret reagent. That's absolutely fine. It's a royal blue as well, which is a bit confusing sometimes. But when you add an equal amount to both of them, if there's only water present and there's no protein, it will stay the blue of the uh, biuret reagent. But if there is any protein present, it will go this purple color. Proteins purple. Now, OK, so we have the three biomolecules completed, the carbohydrates, the lipids and the proteins. Now we have to talk about vitamins. They're vital, vital. And apart from the three, we have to know vitamins and we have to divide them into two categories, the ones that will dissolve in water and the ones that will dissolve in non-water. Don't say water non-soluble, you say fat soluble, you say what they will dissolve in. Just confusing you now. So the things that they will dissolve in. You only have to have one. There's lots. So we choose vitamin C because most of your textbooks choose that. So it's better not to confuse the issue by telling you about vitamin A or C. Vitamin C dissolves in water, which is great. And what's it useful for? It's essential for your growth and repair. It uh, maintains the blood vessels, the arteries, the veins and the little capillaries. It heals the wounds and it actually keeps your teeth and skin and healthy cartilage. So vitamin C is absolutely essential. Now, what about if you didn't have it? You would suffer from a condition known as scurvy. Not a nice picture. Uh, um, this would be you'd have ulcers and you'd have lesions. They're like bruises under your skin, like as if you have a, a bruise and your blood bleeds out. Uh, not good. How do you solve the problem? Lesions. Uh, you actually take food that has vitamin C. Now, the English uh, sailed the ocean blue, as we know. And one of the things that was essential on their ships was the apple barrel. And when they would actually sail into ports that had citrus fruits like apples and sorry, like lemons and and limes, they would suck them. And because uh, pirates always looked like they had no teeth, that was lack of vitamin C. You need them. And the apples had the vitamin C. So other sources, well, they're just behind me here. You have the vitamins and you have all those lovely fruits. So you could remember them, citrus fruits, broccoli and so on. Now, 
The other kind of vitamin we're going to deal with because it's fat soluble, it dissolves in oils, is vitamin D. This is a very unpleasant picture of a child who is lacking vitamin D and you can see that the bones have malformed very badly. You need vitamin D. Now you hear that song, them bones, them bones, and you'll hear me in a minute singing that, but I don't want you to think about that for right now. Osteomalacia. Malaysia means sick bones, basically. Malfoy was a fairly sick individual. J'ai eu du mal. Mal means bad, okay, in, in many, in, in Latin even. So osteomalacia is bad bones. Rickets is the equivalent in children, and it is lack of vitamin D. So you need it to be milk soluble. You need it to be fat soluble. Where do you get it? The vitamin D is got from ultraviolet light. So great to get out for a bit of sunshine and it's get it gets synthesized in your own skin. But the other sources, the food sources are milk, cheese, fatty fish and egg yolks. OK, now minerals. These are the last ones. You need the essential uh, elements in salt form are needed in the organism. Now, animals need, we need iron, fi fi fo fum, iron for my hemoglobin in my red blood cells and they transport oxygen. I must have had something in there where it actually got lost. And of course, I'm going to sing to you now. Them bones, them bones need calcium and so they're for neat teeth and bones and we get them in and of course sodium sodium is needed for our nervous system our quick reactions and our body fluids all have sodium in it in the form of uh, nacl which is salt now that's not just animals we've got to think of the non-animals which are plants and plants also need calcium then plants then plants need calcium they, they do and they needed to actually stick cell walls of one cell to the next. And magnesium is, of course, the essential ingredient in the protein chlorophyll, the pigment. And the chlorophyll is absolutely vital for photosynthesis, which you'll hear all about. Now, where do you get them? Ah, calcium doesn't eat them. I remember having a student once who said that the uh, plant needed magnesium and then said cornflakes. So I can't imagine a, a plant eating the cornflakes to get its magnesium, but it comes up dissolved in the soil. Now, Although it's not a biomolecule, remember a molecule made within a cell, water is essential for life. And this is the last bit of this lesson. And it's a solvent. Things dissolve in it. You don't have to be very far away from the kitchen to smell the toast, uh, even though it's moving from where it was. That's diffusion. Mary Therese did that in the previous lesson. The taste, the smell, things dissolve and you need that. A transport medium, um, your blood, all the things that are dissolved in your blood, it's in water based and it's being circulated and the heat even from your liver is being circulated around your body and it's also involved in a number of metabolic reactions you need water for photosynthesis now one critical thing to watch out for here is here are three words solvent transport medium and involved in metabolic and you said oh yeah remember that and in exams they might say what uh, you know, uses water. And if they say within a cell, you ignore that. Don't mention it because transport is not happening within a cell. It's from one cell to the other in blood vessels and things like that. So don't use transport if they ask you within a cell. But if they said within an organism, then you can mention all three. Okay. Now, this is one of the um, mandatory practicals. We've, uh, and you know, there are three, the test for starch, the test for fats, the test for reducing sugars and the test for protein. They're all there. And the things that are in bold are the things that they ask regularly in the exam. You see, do not boil here, blue to brick red or orange. Over here, no heat required. So that is sort of like a, a condensed piece. And what we also do is um, when we come to the end of a section, which I've just done, um, in terms of food, a one pager where we try and condense everything onto one page. So here it is now. And I just want you to have a look at it. You will have this to look at yourself. So what we've done here is I've put carbohydrate all down here, proteins down here, fats there, vitamins, minerals, and under here is water. Uh, calcium, plants and animals, and then water and roughage over here. 
So if you were to go back now at and watching the video, this is your monosaccharides, what you're supposed to know, reducing sugars, instant energy, that's its role. Here are the two examples I have to know. There's the test, the disaccharides, there's the polysaccharides, you have your glycogen, you have your cellulose, you have your starch, there's this chitin. Here's your test for starch. You could take a coloring pencil and put the colors in there. And this is, it's quite useful to do. And there's what you have to know about the uh, chemical nature of them, the fixed ratio. The proteins over here, CHON and S, the polysaccharides, the test, the monosaccharides, the disaccharides, sorry, the Oh dear, the amino acids, the polypeptides, the peptides and then the polypeptides and you can see the folded 3D and their structural keratin for hair and nails and your metabolic enzymes and hemoglobin. There's your fats, the triglyceride, your test. Remember, no particular ratio, low oxygen, name them in it. And then the vitamins, the water soluble, the fat soluble, the deficiency diseases, then the iron and the calcium, the calcium and the magnesium. And then the roughage, well, that's that picture over there. So you could just link that said cellulose prevents constipation. Mm. And then the water solvent, transport medium and metabolic. And you'd put a bracket beside that and say, not if it's inside the cell when it's asked. Now, the last little piece here is the sample question that came up. Why do we choose these? Because you can't access the answers. Now, I know you can go on to a lot of different uh, uh, websites and find the answers to, you know, the other questions that have been asked since the course started in 2002. But this is one that you couldn't do. So what I've done is I've actually answered it for you. So what I suggest you do is look at the question and see if you can answer it and then look at the rest of it before you see the answer and then that's it. So a long uh, section, but uh, hopefully that was useful. So thank you for watching this great Academy lecture. Until next time, happy learning.